Hello everyone, welcome to this Turpentine Diary podcast. In a recent podcast I talked about Clement Greenberg's influential article about the avant-garde in kitsch. Greenberg was a a leading proponent of American art after uh, World War II when the center of the art universe uh, shifted from Europe, uh, Paris to New York City. And so he had, uh, in his day, his, his pen was powerful and he had a lot of influence. In, in that article, uh, and throughout his writings, Greenberg maintained that modern art, uh, Jackson Pollock and the action painters in, uh, in particular, uh, embodied the um, continuation of the Western, uh, high t- Western traditions of fine art. And things that um, were outside of that were um, kitsch. Kitsch was um, the opposite of uh, good. It was everything uh, that was bad was embodied in that term kitsch. And uh, Greenberg defined kitsch as academic, which is uh, ridiculous. Uh, I, I, talk about, uh, I talked about this a bit more in that podcast if you're interested, uh, and then you can um, uh, listen to that. I think it was published on uh, first week of May uh, of this year, 2019. But I thought I would, in this uh, podcast, talk about um, talk some more about um, academic art and if um, Gr- Greenberg's definition of kitsch as academic is off the mark, which it is, or laughably so. Uh, but wh- why would he? Why would he point to that? What What is there about academic art that Make, makes it suspect. Uh, uh, Greenberg's um, writings were influential, but <clears throat> he came to that opinion uh, based on things that were kind of current in his time about academic art, in particular, the, some of the things that happened in the middle of the uh, 19th century uh, around the birth of modern art. Um, so I'll, I'll loop back to this point uh, later on in this podcast, but so let's talk a little bit about uh, academic art. A little bit of history. When people talk about academic art, they, we, you can talk about it in a generic, general way, of course. And you, um, but what does that point to? Uh, where do these uh, definitions come from? Well, the, uh, the, the academy uh, in this context for fine art refers to primarily the French Academy of Fine Art and to a lesser extent, the, the British Academy. Uh, the French Academy of Fine Art, uh, it's had different names through the years. I think originally it was called the, the Academy of Painting and Sculpture. Uh, I think its current name is uh, Fine Arts, Beaux Arts, still around. <clears throat> um, it was founded in the middle of the 17th century and its purpose was to um, teach art, painting in particular, and sculpture, to um, young artists and to um, uh, serve the, the royal, the government of France, the royal family, the king, same thing, king, government. And um, th- that was its purpose and uh, its goal. And um, through the years, it's uh, that the purpose has uh, shifted and changed, and the goals have shifted and changed. But but if you tease out some of these things, I think we can get to start to see what we what's meant by academic art. Um, but before we go down uh, go down that direction, let's just do a, a quick romp through the history of the French Academy. Initially, after its founding. Uh, and with its uh, patrons, uh, uh, the French government, royalty, the, um, the uh, themes were um, uh, high-toned, I, I think you would say. A um, lot of history paintings, paintings that were uh, like uh, paintings that were uh, influenced by uh, the Enlightenment. That is to say, a lot, as many paintings about um, Roman and Greek history as there were about um, current uh, contemporary European history, um, and of course a lot of uh, uh, butt kissing to the, the French royal family. Uh, as time went on, 
uh, after Louis XIV died, and uh, the uh, court, the French court, uh, moved back to Paris. Sort of the main patrons of the academy and French art um, became the nobility, and there we see in the in the uh, early part of the uh, 18th century a turn away from historic historical painting to um, more uh, intimate types of painting. Uh, and this is the Rococo, which was uh, a lot of people find it, find it very frivolous. A lot of paintings, a lot of the artists I'm thinking about here are Watteau, Boucher, Fragonard. These are artists that were uh, uh, on their way great artists, uh, but their themes were about um, parties and dances and balls and fates and um, play acting and enjoying the good life. Um, which an ability did. Uh, and then um, uh, soon, so in about the middle of the 18th century, the, um, the advent of the uh, semi-annual salon occurred. And the salon was uh, actually a very significant event in the history of um, Western art. Um, artists who were members of the Academy would um, exhibit their works in the Louvre for several months. And uh, at, at, this, at this time, the public museums were uh, practically unknown. The Louvre itself was not yet an art museum. Uh, so these um, exhibitions that were open to the public became huge events in Paris, and they were uh, mo mob scenes would uh, attend them. It became a, a standard um, fair in the papers in Paris to mock the throngs of people and de, uh, bemoan those who are actually trying to uh, see the paintings. And it also uh, gave birth to um, the beginning of what we call, consider today the uh, uh, art loving public. You know, they had for the first time, um, more or less, um, venues where uh, people, uh, uh, non um, royal or noble, uh, the unwashed mashes, so to say, could go look at uh, the uh, contemporary art. And it also gave birth to the beginnings of modern art criticism. A lot of, and a lot of it was anonymous. Uh, does it sound familiar? It should sound familiar to you with the internet today. A lot of the early art criticism regarding the salons were anonymous. And uh, y y believe it or not, the artists of those days did not like that, did not like uh, this kind of uh, swirling criticism. Some of the um, top painters in those days, and some of them were extremely uh, well paid. I mean, they made, you know, today would be millions and millions of dollars um, uh, for their time, would boycott the, um, boycott the uh, salon because they didn't, they didn't uh, agree with this uh, uncensored um, criticism that would circulate. And the reason for that is even though the, the public was born and could participate to an extent in contemporary art, it really still wasn't the buying public. The buying public continued to be the royal, the government, the royal family, and um, uh, the nobility, those, uh, those, that class. And um, so this was a this was a, a interesting times back and forth with this, and of course, uh, um, later on in the 18th century was the French Revolution. The French Re Revolution was a significant watershed in the history of the West. It changed um, many things, and the art world was no exception. With the demise of the uh, French royal family, the uh, purpose for the um, Academy uh, was gone. So um, for a time, the Academy was show, uh, shut down and was uh, defunct. After, uh, after the revolution had settled down, and uh, especially during the rise of Napoleon, the Academy was uh, revived, and um, it's still with us more or less today to serve the, um, serve the government of uh, France <clears throat> in more or less the same capacity it had served the government in the past to teach art students the fundamentals of art, pass down the studio traditions, and to um, absorb patronage from the state. And uh, I think um, anybody with a modicum of art history knowledge 
um, can conjure up uh, images uh, of Napoleon in heroic poses and whatever, and that, uh, and that's those the kind of things that the uh, Academy uh, did at, on its rebirth. And uh, the Academy uh, continued on after the Restoration, where uh, again it uh, its purpose was to, and this brings us to. 1848, that significant year of the revolutions across Europe where the, the monarchies finally, many of them, uh, at least the one in France, fell um, permanently. It was also saw the birth of uh, the modern art in, in the shape of, uh, uh, depends on where you want to draw the line, uh, the realists like Courbet and Manet or the impressionist. Um, but I'll do back to this. Um, in brief, that is a sketch of the uh, history of the French Academy and um, wherein lies um, the pejorative term. Where can we point to to say, aha, there's, there's why the Academy uh, is representative of kitsch? Um, well, it's really not clear, is it? Um, if you just take a, a, a brief look at the... Uh, uh, different schools that were predominant at different times it, it, you'd be left, be left scratching your head uh, so if you think um, it was some ideal was uh, the the embodiment of kitsch uh, like uh, you're not going to have a uh, very firm ground to stand on just to, just a quick run through this as well uh, initially as I mentioned the Academy was uh, um, influenced by uh, uh, historical paintings. Um, those are considered serious paintings. Of course, there were other genre paintings. There's always been genre paintings. But the, uh, the high goal was a, a history painting, or his, his paintings about themes of historical subject. And they're usually quite large, and they would only be appropriate for places, public places that had the space to accommodate them. Uh, that led to a reaction against this uh, sort of heavy-handed, high-minded high seriousness and brought the Rococo and was um, more intimate and uh, about more um, the concerns of the, the lesser nobility and the upper middle class and the kind of things, the kind of life that they experienced or would like to experience parties, dances, musicals, those kind of things. And, and then the will turned and uh, there was a reaction against the, uh, that frivolity with the advent of uh, neoclassicism uh, embodied by the great David. And that in turn, there was a reaction to that and that in turn led to um, romanticism. And we could think of artists like um, Delacroix, uh, I guess it was the primary, primary one. And, and then in time, uh, the reaction against uh, romanticism led to realism, both academic and, uh, and sort of outside academic. Anyway, it, the point of this is, if you think that academic art embodies some sort of um, uh, style or ideal, you, you'd be wrong. There's been a lot of different styles through, the, the, um, through its history. And if you... If you look at the other purpose for the academy, which was to teach young artists um, how to be competent, I think regardless of what was fashionable at any given time, the, that, that goal stayed constant. And there were certain uh, ways to approach learning art that were um, instilled in students. I think for some people, uh, when they talk about academic art, this is what they're talking about. The kind of, um, to take the negative case, the kind of cold uh, competency that does not um, impart um, high art necessarily or interesting art. You can be competent, uh, the belief is, and not and produce not very interesting or good work. and. It's strange to consider, isn't it, um, that of all the fields today, competency in uh, fine art is under a cloud. If you're into rock music, for example, uh, you're expected to uh, play your instruments. There's a premium on people who can play. 
and especially if you're in the recording studio, the premium on understanding uh, how to get the best sound possible. If you're into acting, it's a craft, it's taken seriously. If you're doing video production, uh, it's all very serious and, and, and competency is a minimum requirement and there's never any suspicion on, on that. But in fine arts, for some reason, there is. And, um, well, you, you know, the, if those who think that pointing to uh, competency in drawing is the culprit and that represents ac uh, academic art, they, they just don't have the leg to stand on. The actual practice in the uh, academy was all young uh, students uh, spent time learning to draw um, several years and then after they reach a certain level of competency uh, it was at that point where they were considered uh, advanced enough to actually learn the the real secrets of art and that is how to paint or and what would happen uh, we're talking now in the period of the first half of the 19th century the students would uh, sign up with masters and there was uh, uh, great competition to be attached to this master or that master and um, and some were more popular than others and uh, in those in those um, ateliers and those studios of those established artists uh, those ac members of the academy was where the artists got their final training and were uh, expected to produce art, great art, whatever it is they wanted to do. and um, But that was the established practice. Artists, uh, students could pick their master and there was great competition among them. And so where, where is this system um, kitsch? Where, where do we find uh, the kitsch here? Where does all this come from, right? Let's just let's, let's think about this a second. Um, competency is uh, certainly cannot be were the definition of kitsch. I was, that's ludicrous. Well, one thing, through all the changes of the public, through the changes of the patrons, the changes of the government, one thing that was consistent with the academy then and today is that it serves the government. And uh, therein, I think, is the issue. Uh, and that's my thesis. That's my thesis, this academic art and the kind that we call kitsch is the art that is um, serves the government. Art has had to deal with politics, uh, and in that period, uh, it was very dangerous. It wasn't just a, a parlor room uh, debate. It was a matter of life and death oft times. Uh, you could be labeled the enemy of the people. From revolution to counter-revolution, art became the head, handmaiden of... Uh, politics and um, became timid. It lost its um, vigor and confidence, uh, certainly the confidence it had at the outset of the academy. Artists retreated into the safe, the sentimental, and um, that was the shape of things in the, in the middle of the uh, 19th century. And I think this is what I think of when uh, we talk about kitsch has nothing to do with academic art or competency or anything like that. So let me end here, listeners, with a question for you. Was the advent of modern art um, the corrective for the ills that plagued the academy? Or was it something else? A different kind of retreat, perhaps? Anyway, thanks everyone for listening.